One of the reasons I love making and giving handmade gifts is that they are so meaningful. They're meaningful to the recipients because it's something I made especially for them. But you can also incorporate other kinds of meaning, such as adding words or phrases that are meaningful, or you can use objects that have meaning. In today's video, I'm going to show you how you can use buttons to make jewelry that everyone will be able to relate to. Hi there, Sandy here. Welcome to another podcast polymer clay jewelry video at keepsakecrafts.net. So I'm guessing that many of us have button boxes from relatives. I know I have my grandmothers, I have my mother-in-laws, I just received a bunch of buttons from a neighbor. I have quite a collection of buttons. Not everybody in the family sews or crafts or has any use for them. But I thought of this way of creating jewelry that I could give to the relatives in the family and tell them that the patterns were from you know, their mother-in-law's or mom's button box. So we're going to form beads using imprints from buttons. And I've shown you how to use this molding putty before. If you want more detail, I'll link to a video that I did a while back that shows you all the details. All you do with the molding putty is you take an equal part of each color and just mix them together. Some of them you have to work a little bit more quickly than others. Some of them start to set up pretty quick on you, so you have to be fast. So you just keep smooshing until there are no more streaks and it's all one uniform color. Once you have your molding putty all molded, just roll it into a smooth ball so that you don't have any creases or wrinkles. Set it on your surface and then go ahead and press in your piece that you want to mold. Now you can see when you press down, I'll lift this up so you can see, how this kind of comes up over the edge of the button just to make life easier on yourself, go ahead and flatten that down because remember we're going to be trying to put two pieces together to make a lentil shaped button and this will just make it easier. So then you just have to wait for these to cure. It depends on the brand, how long it's going to take. You can tell it's cured though when you poke a fingernail in and it doesn't leave an impression. So if I poke now, you can see that that's still in there. Once your molds are set, then you can mix together some clay. And I went ahead and mixed together about two parts Pardo translucent and one part pearl. You could also use white, but I like the little bit of shimmer that the pearl gives. And you could, of course, experiment with other colors, but for trying to make a faux porcelain look, I think this is a nice mix. So then you're just going to grab yourself bits of clay and it's kind of trial and error finding how much works in each button mold. Now if you want your buttons to be the same front and back, you'll need to make two molds of each button. But I think it's kind of cool to have something different on each side. So roll your ball so that it's nice and smooth, it doesn't have any creases pop it into the mold. I can tell already that's going to be too much. I'm going to take another one and press it on the back. And when I peel that out, you can see that that was too much because I have this whole edge around here. So I'm just going to pull off some of the clay and try again. And this is what you'll need to do for each of your beads is just kind of experiment And often it's really better to err on the side of making it a little small rather than a little large because if it's a little small you won't end up with this lip like I've got on this. So if I take out like a third of that I'll show you what I get. Remember to always roll your clay back to nice and smooth because any creases that are in the ball are not going to get pressed out. They will be in your finished bead. Now by making that smaller, I don't have that lip. This is a little thin, so you'll have to just try, experiment with different shapes and sizes until you like what you get. Now I don't mind that this is a little off center, I kind of like that look, but you might want to uh, be a little bit, take a little bit more care and have beads that are perfectly centered. So if you have a nice deep one, like say this one here, You can use a bit more clay. And 
then you have a really cool two-sided bead. And it's a nice flat bead which hangs nicely. Once you have your beads all done, you really need to let them sit overnight, at least a couple hours to firm up before you try to put in the hole. Here's a bead that I made yesterday and I'll use this one to show you how to make the hole. My favorite tool for piercing holes in beads is a doll needle because it's hard, it's sharp, it's thin, it's nice and long so you can pierce all kinds of things. So you want to start at one side where you want the hole and just twist the needle and be looking. Focus your eyes right where you want that needle to come out. It's a hand-eye coordination thing and most of the time it will come out right where you want it. Now that's coming out a little close to this side that I'm looking at. A little too close for me and that's fine. I'm going to back that out and then put the needle in right where that hole is but more centered on the bead. And You can just kind of take your finger and stroke that and make that hole you made go away. And now I'm going to look right at this hole, twirl and press lightly and just hold very lightly with your left hand or your non-dominant hand and it will pop right out that hole. It's pretty cool. Now let me show you what happens. Here's the bead I just made and it's probably going to be, already it's distorting around that hole no matter how lightly I hold it. It can be done, maybe it depends on the brand of clay, if you have a nice firm brand. Again, I wasn't looking where I should have been, so that didn't come out where it should have. But that's okay, I'll just back it out, stroke over that spot. See how this is becoming a little bit more oblong and my texture is a little bit flattened. It really is better to just let your beads sit. That's not bad, but yeah, see how it's all flattened and smushed? And it, that didn't happen on this bead. So let your beads rest before you make the holes. Now another thing that you can do is make some bigger beads for your focal. And what you might want to do for the focal is not drill the hole right down the middle. In fact, you could drill them all off center. Here's one. I thought it was pretty done with the rose button mold and I actually made my hole about a third of the way down and that will keep the bead from spinning and flipping and keep it hanging nicely on your necklace. So you could do that with all of your beads and have them all strung that way. If you were doing a bracelet you might want to make two holes in each one, two parallel holes to keep them nice and flat. Once you have your beads made and the holes pierced, then you can bake them according to the manufacturer's instructions. So for this project, once your beads are all baked, it's time to add color. And in this case, we are using liquid clay and alcohol inks. But the alcohol inks that I'm using, I don't know about other brands, all I own are Ranger inks but they require a little bit of testing and experimentation. The first thing I did was I pulled out all of the liquid clay that I have. It includes Kato Liquid Poly Clay, Sculpey Translucent Liquid Sculpey, also known as TLS, and Fimo Deco Gel. And I mixed into each of those a single drop of alcohol ink in cranberry, which is a beautiful bright red color. What was amazing was how different the colors looked when being mixed into the clay. But then once they were baked, I ended up with this very different kind of orangey pale sad color. I was not impressed. So I decided to see if I could get a purple that I liked and I picked three different blues that I had. These are all Ranger Alcohol Inks. Denim, I added to this one with the Deco Gel. Stream, I added to the TLS. And Sailboat Blue, I added to the Kato. And you can see how very different they look when they're all mixed up, but that's very little indication of what they're going to look like when they're baked. This is what we ended up with. So although the Cranberry by themselves, they look pretty similar. Uh, we got kind of different unexpected results from 
the additional inks. So this is why I say you really need to do some planning. If you're looking for a particular color, it may take quite a bit of experimentation. Now I've seen this project done also with pinata alcohol inks, and I don't know if there's quite so much color shifting. I don't have any pinata inks, but I hope to test them sometime soon. So I would call this a fail. I am really truly not happy with any of these colors. I tried a few different things. I tried adding more alcohol ink to the liquid clay to see if I could get more of a true color. I thought perhaps it was diluted too much and that was why my cranberry was more of a pink. And it, it is a little bit darker but it's still got that kind of yellowish quality that I don't like. This, of all of them, this is probably the one I like the best, but I still don't love it. But it occurred to me that something about this process with the Ranger inks is causing a bit of yellowishness to get introduced into my colors. So I actually went ahead and made a whole new batch of beads and decided to go with a different color. By the way, this is a good warning to not have too much of the liquid clay on your bead because it will cause drips and just make a mess. So these aren't a total waste. I may paint them someday with something else, but I'm not going to use them for this project. So I thought about it and decided, well, if it's adding a little bit of yellow to my mix, then what colors look good with yellow added to them? Not the blues and purples that I usually go for, but green, which is blue and yellow, so we can make it a little bit more yellow that'll be okay or orange which I wasn't in the mood for I'm not very often and I'm adding a, just about a drop of alcohol ink and you could put in a little bit more liquid clay than that mix the two together and then paint them on your beads and this will be a slightly stronger mix because I've got more of the ink in proportion to liquid clay so I thought I might make it a little darker and all I have here is a piece of 20 gauge wire that's a little bit wider than my baking tray and this makes it so much easier to just do to do first of all to do two sides at once because now I can flip it over all at once and I don't have my hands all in there getting all gooky which was kind of a mess and you can do both sides at once. Much more efficient way of doing it. And now I'm just going to gently wipe with the towel. You, like I said, you don't want to leave too much on, but you want to take some off so that it's white on top and left in the crevices. And you can see here that if you choose patterns that are nice and deep, like this one looks fantastic, and this one is okay. It'll look nice when it's done, but it doesn't show up the color nearly as well. This is my bead baking tray. It's just a dis disposable aluminum foil baking pan. And like I said, I cut my wire a little bit wider and I used an awl and poked a hole on each side. So then you just slide your wire through, bend it up, and bake away. By the way, quick tip for you. I've seen so many different tutorials saying to use binder clips to hold these together, but they're metal and they stay hot. What I love about using wooden clothespins, I'll show you what I mean. Here's another pan that I'm putting upside down on top. And I use wooden clothespins on all, one on each side. Even coming out of a 275 degree oven, I can touch this and take it off and take a look. Don't touch the middle part. So then go ahead and bake your beads. I bake them for probably 15-20 minutes. So here are the beads out of the oven. This is what I ended up with and I'm satisfied with it. I kind of wanted a little bit more color, but these will be pretty, especially once I choose some nice accenting beads. I'm going to string them, I think, with two strands of bead stringing wire having double strands of smaller beads in between them. Here are several of the beads that I pulled out as possibilities to go with my button stamped beads. And the very first thing I did was of course I went into my greens. I pictured maybe something with some 
crackle and sparkle like these beads. And this is definitely a yellow green, so I pulled out some yellow greens. I really like this. It's got a matte finish, so it's kind of a different texture. And these are nice. These are from the Dollar Bead Box. They're Czech glass rondelles in opaque olive green with travertine. These are agates, which I don't think I'm going to use. I was thinking of maybe doing something a little different than I usually do. I'm very comfortable with choosing a whole variety of one color and then a metallic, so dark and light greens and antique brass or antique gold. Awesome with that, but I wanted to kind of push myself. So I was thinking, what about if I threw in some orange? Or I don't want to do red, it's too close to Christmas. We're going to have enough red and green. Orange sounded interesting, a pop of that. So I opened my orange and yellow box, which are all in one box, because they're probably my least favorite colors. And I was looking at these, it's a clear plastic box. So I was looking at these and they looked really green to me. And I was thinking, wow, did I misfile them? Did I put them in the wrong box? And then I realized the bottom of the box was clear and the yellow beads were showing through it. And I had it sitting on my lap on top of my blue pants. So the blue through the yellow made these look much more green than they are. So <laughs> funny story, but good to keep in mind that you got to consider what kind of reflections and what other things are around you that are going to influence the appearance of your colors. I also pulled out these crystals. These are just from Michaels, I think. And so many of you have told me that you really enjoy watching me figure out and plan and design. So I'll just speed up that process and show you how it worked out. Here I am trying to decide if I'm going to use these glass beads. So many of you have told me that you have been inspired by and benefited and learned from my videos and that makes me so happy because that is what I have set out to do with my blog and this YouTube channel. If you want even more inspiration and benefits for yourself, you might consider becoming a patron because my patrons, in addition to getting sneak peeks and bonuses and behind the scenes, my patrons can also get up to two bonus videos every month and their video tutorials. Patrons get other things. They'll get, like I said, maybe a sneak peek video that everybody else doesn't get. Something to think about. And not only do you get the satisfaction of knowing you're helping keep these tutorials coming for everybody, but you get extras for yourself. Well, what I really pictured here was having two rows of beads in between these. You know, so many times I've designed a piece of jewelry um, and lived with it for a while, wore it a few times even, and then went back and took it apart. So don't feel like you have to get it exactly precisely the right way the first time, or is there a right way? If you're not thrilled with it after wearing it for a while, well then try again. So there, that is what I have settled on. I think I need to find a couple little bead cones or something to finish these ends. I'm just going to have two strands. One strand will have some of these matte beads, which I think are really nice enhancement to these all these other beads. And then the other strands will alternate the dark green crystal cubes and the check glass beads. And then it's just a matter of stringing. So to get started, I have slid a crimp onto the end of a piece of bead stringing wire and then slid the end back through it to make a loop of the bead stringing wire. Then slide the crimp up to leave just a little loop. And ideally it should be small enough so that when it's inside your bead cap it's hidden. So that's awesome. And then you can use regular crimping pliers. I'm going to use my one-step crimper and flatten that crimp. And to make sure it's secure, just tuck your pliers in there into the loop and give it a pull and make sure it's not going anywhere. Once you're sure of that, you can trim off the excess wire and repeat this step for a second wire. Now I've just taken an eye pin and attached both those loops to the eye pin and then I can slide on my cover that will cover up those ends. If I had had gold bead stringing wire I would have used that. I just 
I didn't. <laughs> so this is all I have. So I'm going to use this and make it work. The tricky thing with doing two strands is that sometimes at the ends a bit of the wire can show. So here you can see that dilemma. Where In this case it looks like all I really need to do is add another one of these frosted beads. Let's see how that works out. And so that looks pretty good. Now you can still see a little bit of the wire here. And if that bugs you, what you need to do is find some very, very small beads. One thing that stands in great for small beads is crimps. You can use those as filler. I've used them in place of, you know, they're, they're basically teeny tiny be beads. And they work great to fill in spaces that need to be filled in. So that looks pretty cool. I'm, I'm happy with that. Now if I had gold wire, I might not have bothered adding that extra little bead in. But I think that'll be nice because I'm going to have gold caps on the sides and then gold chain going around the sides and the back of the necklace. So those little tiny beads will not only fill in the spaces, but they'll also help tie it all in together. Another thing you might find helpful in filling in these gaps when you're stringing multiple strands this way is, well, this all really depends on the kind of beads you have, but I'm using these frosted matte glass beads and you'll notice that they vary quite a bit in thickness. Here's one, here's the other, quite a bit thinner. And so if you find these skinnier ones, reserve those for putting on the ends closer to the beads. And that will actually help things nestle together more easily. And here's another tip for you. Sometimes your holes will be just barely big enough to string through, especially with the two strands here. Some of them are just a little tight. So what you do is you take your pliers, flat nose pliers are great because they're nice and wide and give you a good grip, and you grip your wire real close to, but not right next to, your bead. And so you maybe leave a millimeter of wire showing. And then you push. Now if you grab it out here too far, it's just going to bend as you push. So the secret is to be patient and just grab it a little tiny bit each time. See that was even that, what's that? Two millimeters, that's too much. It starts bending. So just a little tiny bit. And you can do this with other things too, with head pins and things that just barely don't want to go through. Just grab it real close, be very patient, don't get greedy and leave too much space and eventually you'll be able to work it through so that you can pull it through the other end. Now I've done all my stringing, I'm just going to go ahead and add my caps on the end and just finish everything off. And you could do this with a simple loop or a wrapped loop. I'm going to do a wrapped loop so it's just, it just adds a decorative element and it's nice and secure. If you want to know more details about how to make wrapped loops, I've done an entire video just showing all the little step-by-steps and the finer points of how to do that. Straighten out that loop. And this is where you'll attach some necklace chain, whatever length you want. Now when you get to this stage, it may be hanging a little bit funny because it's... We've got two strands and they're a little bit stiff. And it just... yeah, it's funny how much less nice <laughs> a piece of jewelry can feel when the beads are strung just a little bit too tightly. It doesn't make a huge difference over the length of a piece of necklace, maybe an eighth of an inch. And now suddenly can you see how much nicer that's draping? So just give it a little bit of room. It, even if you have a tiny bit of the wire showing, that won't be nearly as noticeable as a necklace that hangs awkwardly. Just take your time and adjust it. Once you're happy with the way it's hanging, go ahead and string a crimp bead on the wire end. Send the wire right back through that bead. If you're attaching this to something with a closed loop, this is the point where you would put this wire through it. But since I'm attaching it to an eye pin that I can twist open, it's just so much easier to manage without having to 
deal with the eye pen right now. And again, I'm going to use my one step bloopers. And if you want to learn more about using the bloopers, I've also done an entire video on them. These are just a great tool for making your jewelry making a little bit easier and more efficient. But no matter how wonderful the tool, always check you don't want your necklace coming apart on you. Repeat for the other wire. Attach them to your eye pin. Attach, slide them into your cone. Add a bit of add a clasp and a bit of chain and a length that suits you and your necklace is done. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Take a look at my Patreon page for how you can get bonus tutorials and great reports and help support these videos. Happy creating!